taking as a theme praying amid the virus. And I've been inspired again by a book that I was reading by um, American theologian Walter Brueggemann. Some of the Castle Street folk will already have heard one sermon coming out from uh, this book. But this is an, another chapter when he reflects on what kind of things we pray about and what is the effect of praying when we're in a situation similar to the one now. So he often um, relates the ideas of plague and pestilence in the Old Testament to the idea of virus today. So mass illness, basically. So that's where the direction of the service is going to be going, what prayer is like in times like this. So we're going to begin our worship with the hymn, Be Still and Know That I Am God. Prayer is a topic that I think we should both talk about more and also actually a bit less. Um, just going to try and run a video and I'm not as experienced as Kirk at doing all of this stuff on Zoom. So just give me a second because I think I've just... We often use too many words to pray as if the more we pour out to God, um, the better our prayers might be. And so today I'd like to invite you to share in some stillness and some silence. And I hope that if perhaps this might feel a bit too embarrassing doing this at church, then actually you'll feel more comfortable at home. So there's going to be some words and some music to listen to with three moments of pause before the music will fade out. You might like to look at the the candle burning on the video screen, or you might prefer to switch off uh, and just close your eyes if you prefer. So we need to begin by just making sure we're sitting comfortably and physically relaxed. You might want to have your feet placed onto the floor and your legs uncrossed. And just take a deeper breath in, pause, and then let it out again. Allow your breathing to be in its natural pattern. And allow every part of your body to relax by first thinking about that part and then allowing it to relax. So starting with your feet, your lower legs, thighs, your stomach, your shoulders and neck and rotate them and move them if you and your hands, allowing them to find a natural and comfortable position. And just for a few moments, allow your mind and body to be relaxed and still. If your mind starts to fill up with thoughts and chatter, just breathe in again and let the breath go. 
and maybe say silently to yourself words such as love and peace. You're just going to be still and silent for a moment. surrounded by God's love. God's love supports you and carries you when you grow tired. God's love washes over you, restoring you when you grow frustrated. God's love fills you and calms you when fears and worries start to overwhelm you. God's love strengthens you when you grow weary with days that feel the same. Be aware of God's love enfolding you gently. Accept the loving embrace of God so that you know you are loved by God and you love God in return. To know and to rest in the gift of God's love is to praise God. and Mother God, our loving parent. We thank you that although we are apart from each other, we are bound together by your love. We thank you that your love is so great that nothing stands in its way, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are sorry for the times when by our actions or inaction, by our words or our silence, we have tried to break with your love for us. Thank you that you sent Jesus to show us a life of perfect love, to give up his life for us and for our salvation. Thank you that the power of divine love is so strong that even death was broken by its power and Jesus raised to life, inviting us to follow his way of living, his way of the cross, his way of resurrection. thank you that we are wrapped up entirely in your endless love. We ask that the perfect love of Jesus may fill our lives so that we can live without fear, able to love him by loving those we meet. Amen. share another hymn, Through the Love of Christ our Saviour.
precious is the blood that healed us, perfect is the grace that sealed us, strong the hand stretched forth to shield us, all must be well. Though we pass through has purchased full salvation, all, all is well. Happy still in God confiding, fruitful if in Christ abiding, holy through the Spirit. The Old Testament reading, I think, needs just a little bit of context before we hear it. And if you were to follow in your Bibles on 1 Kings chapter 8, you will see that it's quite a long reading. So we've, I've cut it down a bit to just take some of the verses to give you a, a flavour of the whole. And the setting for it is that King Solomon ha is commissioning the newly built temple and all of its very fine contents. Finally, the work is completed, so he gathers all of the people for the ceremony of dedication. And in that, he makes this prayer. And the prayer functions partly as a reminder of the history of faith. It starts by remembering God's promises to King David, Solomon's father. And it's a kind of worked example of what it means to finally have a built place for prayer. The entire section of the set is rather long and it gives seven examples of the need for prayer, covers wars and natural disasters. And each time the suggested prayer should ask God to hear or to heed and to forgive. Finally, Solomon at the end of it affirms that God will and does hear and will and does forgive. And Solomon praises God's faithfulness. So now we hear our reading from 1 Kings chapter 8. Reading from 1 Kings chapter 8. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites, before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. The covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, Keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, There shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your children look to their way, to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed. 
which you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Have regard to your servant's prayer and to his plea. O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day towards this house, the place of which you said, My name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays towards this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. O oh, hear in heaven your dwelling place, heed and forgive. If someone sins against a neighbour and is given an oath to swear, and comes and swears before your altar in this house, then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing their conduct on their own head and vindicating the righteous by rewarding them according to their righteousness. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you and then they pray towards this place, confess your name and turn from their sin because you punish them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, when you teach them the good way in which they should walk, and grant rain on your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. If there is famine in the land, if there is plague, blight, mildew, locust or caterpillar, if their enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever plea there is from any individual or, for, or from all your people Israel, all knowing the afflictions of their own hearts, so that they stretch out their hands towards this house, then here in heaven your dwelling place, forgive, act and render to all whose hearts you know according to all their ways, for only you know what is in every human heart, so that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land and that you gave to our ancestors. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy, so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near, and if they come to their senses in the land to which they have been taken captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors saying we have sinned and have done wrong we have acted wickedly if they repent with all their heart and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you towards their land which you gave to their ancestors the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name then, here in heaven, your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea, maintain their cause. And forgive your people who have sinned against you, and all their transgressions that they have committed against you, and grant them compassion in the sight of their captors, so that they may have compassion on them. Now when Solomon finished offering all this prayer and this plea to the Lord, he arose from facing the altar of the Lord, where he had knelt with hands outstretched towards heaven. He stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice. Blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he has promised. Not one word hath failed of all his good promise, which he spoke through his servant Moses. The Lord our God is with us. As he was with our ancestors, may he not leave us or abandon us, but incline our hearts to him, to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his ordinances, which he commanded our ancestors. Let these words of mine, with which I have pleaded before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, and may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel, as each day requires, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, there is no other. 
Therefore devote yourselves completely to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments as at this day. Amen. I wonder how has your prayer life been in these last nine months? And what have you been praying about and for? Now, you might be very glad that we're not in church at this moment because those are exactly the kind of questions that I would like you to ask your neighbour. Well, that would be a little complicated today, so we can skip that bit. But it means that I have to imagine what your possible answers might be. So perhaps for the subject of prayers, I would guess, yes, coronavirus and its impacts has definitely been high on the subject of our prayers. Praying for those we know who have been ill, praying for the medical staff and the care home staff, praying too for the countries which don't have the same levels of health care that we have here. It's interesting, isn't it, that even in today's non-religious society, when something bad happens, people still assure each other of our thoughts and our prayers. I think thoughts alone don't convey enough of the, the good wishes and depth of emotion and love that prayer intends. But the answers about the quantity of our prayer lives may well vary. Some of you say, mm, no different, just the same as before. That might mean you pray a lot or you pray very little, but nothing's changed. Perhaps though, you found yourself praying a lot more than normal. We've had far more resources available, not only online church like this, but broadcasts from other churches on YouTube. Um, there was a bit more on television and radio at the beginning, the service sheets that get sent out. I know some people have been doing two or even three church services every Sunday and then catching up with others during the week. There was a bit of hullabaloo at the beginning about the Archbishop of Canterbury leading a service of communion and prayers from his kitchen table. But I liked it. Surely we should be able to pray at home. After all, Jesus spent quite a bit of his time in different people's homes at the kitchen table. Well, they didn't have kitchen tables in those days, but you know what I mean. But there is another possibility, and that is that without that regular routine of physically going to church, you found it much harder to pray because the routine of going and the place of prayer are important to you. The church building matters because it is our place of prayer dedicated for the purpose of prayer above any of the other activities that happen in it. If there is no prayer and no worship in a church building, then it becomes just another place, perhaps steeped in history and architectural interest, perhaps the result of hours of labour and fundraising, but without prayer, it is just bricks. It has no heart. The Old Testament reading describes how the temple is, above everything else, a place of prayer. I wonder if we think about the temple, we, we think of it in other terms, perhaps as a bit too dominated by thinking of it as a place of sacrifice, or of the story where Jesus drives out the noisy traders with a whip, all the chaos around and very little prayer at all. Although it was used for those functions, the temple was above all a place of prayer. And King Solomon describes the kinds of reasons why the people might come to the temple for prayer. I doubt very much it's an exhaustive list because most of it is about national need rather than personal need. And we do know that people brought their personal need into their praying in the temple. Just remember the story of how Hannah is in the temple praying for a child, for example. In this dedication ceremony, King Solomon describes seven disasters when people absolutely should pray to God in the temple, or if they're in captivity, they must turn their thoughts again towards the temple. Sin against a neighbour, military defeat, drought, plague, blight, mildew and caterpillar, I noticed, in times of war, in, in captivity or in enslavement, and if a foreigner needs to pray. And each time the disaster is described, we hear the same words being repeated. God is asked to hear and God is asked to forgive. And that response will be enough to change the disastrous situation. So as we are now in a time of plague or virus, 
is this model of prayer also relevant to us, to how we can be praying, whether we are able to be in the church building or now as we are today at home? Yes, to some extent, it is a model of us. Each of the prayers expresses the nation's trust in God. This isn't about religious dogma or understandings of the character of God. It's about the relationship between God and Israel. The people praying do not know that God will respond, but they believe and trust that their prayer is heard and that God will respond. In the time of virus, we too cannot know that our prayers will be answered, for such knowledge is not part of faith. But we can trust God, who has promised to hear us and to help us. The very act of praying is an expression of trust. The plea in the text is that God will not just hear, but will also forgive. Now here is a bit of belief that we may struggle with because it says that the people have done something wrong and that the something wrong then leads to the disaster. And that if God forgives them the wrong, then the disaster will go away as if God has also sent the disaster to them. This is a tricky thing. From one perspective, this belief highlights that God is all powerful, that God is in control and therefore God can turn disaster and desperation into relief and restoration. Now, I don't have a problem with that. I do believe that God can change dreadful situations. I believe that God actively wants to stop suffering and to give us good life instead. But I don't believe that God sends us disasters. In fact, with this coronavirus, there's a good case to be made that human actions have created the perfect storm of circumstances for a virus to cross from animal to human and for us to piggyback it in our aeroplanes all around the world. It's our doing, not God's. But the element of forgiveness is very important. It's the understanding of the writer of our text that forgiveness is the essential precursor to well-being. We understand that too. We often need to forgive ourselves and to forgive others in order to find the well-being and peace that we long for. So to pray in the temple in Jerusalem, in church or at home, is the right thing to do in the right place and leads to a good result because it is fundamentally about the trusting relationship between God and the people who are praying. That's the view of the text, and there is much that is positive and helpful here. But there's a bit of propaganda going on as well. The dedication of the temple is a big ceremony with the king at the center of it. The power of the king and the splendor and power of the temple are linked. Walter Brueggemann, the theologian, puts this in a memorable modern phrase. He says, the temple was a media engine for the king. Let that ring a warning in our minds, because we know today how a king can use social media to promote an image and a message that is all about the king's own power, the king as hugely positive, efficacious, and indeed the embodiment of a miracle. With a quick apology to our uh, new, new American friends, I want you to think about that White House video, the promo they did of President Trump leaving hospital. Very quickly, they put out a very slick video of him landing by helicopter on the White House lawn, climbing the steps and solemnly and strongly saluting as the copter roared away. And with thumping patriotic music, the message was clear. Here, this strong man has defeated the virus facing the world. He has triumphed and he will lead you into triumph as well. Well, perhaps not quite as he imagined at any rate. But you can see how we must read King Solomon's great patriotic call to prayer in the temple as well, with just a little bit of wariness about it all. This is also propaganda. 
And if we take it too literally, then we might all end up worshipping the wrong thing. It's not about the king and the splendours of the temple at all. It's about the relationship between God and the people. We should be wary of the text, I think, for another reason. And that's because the relationship of prayer and answer is complex. It isn't that God answers the prayer and dishes out the result that we want. Even the rhythmic repetition of the words in the Bible reading is not supposed to be an incantation or a spell. Praying is not like being in Harry Potter, where you have to learn the right prayer words with the right intonation and the right swish of the wand. Prayer is not magic. In fact, the focus in our reading is not on the answer at all. We're given no detail of the exact nature of the problem, nor of what actually happens afterwards. The focus is entirely on the relationship between God and the person praying, the pray all. I want you to think now about your experiences of praying about something really important to you. A prayer that happens in the context of some kind of disaster for you personally or for those known to you, such as praying in times of great illness or loss, unemployment or a major life change. When you start praying, your fake focus is naturally and positively upon your concern. And whether you use lots of words, or whether you simply sit with your struggles and emotions, your need is great and your distress may be quite overwhelming. But as you pray, what happens? Perhaps you feel an immediate answer to prayer. That can and does happen. Perhaps a certain clarity about what you must do or the feeling that God is doing something miraculous and amazing in an instant. Maybe you feel a kind of relieving and softening of the burden, the fear perhaps, that you are carrying. In the process of praying, maybe in an instant, or maybe over months and months of praying, you find that your focus is less and less on the disaster and more and more on God. It is not that your problem has become any less, but that your relationship with God has deepened so that your trust in God's love and forgiveness has grown stronger, so strong that it helps you face the disaster with a sense of God's accompaniment and presence where you previously felt alone, God's strength where you felt weak, God's guidance where you felt lost. To put this in other words, when we pray, we find ourselves restored by God, which means that we are forgiven by God. Even if we were not aware that we needed forgiveness, we discover that we are forgiven. Even if we did not ask for forgiveness, we realise that we are released, we are forgiven. And we turn to God in deeper reverence, deeper praise, deeper trust. Our focus is not on all that we fear about the virus, not on all that we have lost. Our focus becomes directed to God and we discover again and again how essential God is to all that we are. Prayer changes us. It creates trust. It fills us with God's love. It reveals to us what eternal life looks and feels like. It takes time and we may only get glimpses, but in the end we are united with God. And in this process we discover one more thing. We are not content. In fact, we are restless anew with divine love which has such energy and power that it overflows from the boundaries of our hearts. We cannot contain and measure God's love. Love leads us to love, to love one another, to, hope, to take hope-filled action against despair and want, hunger and injustice. Our inner transformation does not stay only inner and spiritual. It is the heart of who we are, and also the heart of what we do. 
just as the temple or the church without prayer is just bricks and stone. So the Christian without prayer is empty. But with prayer, we are called, inspired and empowered to spread God's love in words and in actions. Prayer overflows into the signs of God's kingdom, in the fulfilment of Jesus's teaching and in the sharing of the good news. It just does. It always does. Amen. We're going to hear a reading from the New Testament about prayer. Matthew chapter 7, beginning to read at verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Thanks be to God. For our prayers, I'm going to be using some prayers uh, from this book by Walter Brueggemann, uh, reflecting on that gospel passage, and then we'll share the Lord's Prayer together, and then a prayer about the pandemic, a prayer for the pandemic. So let us pray. We do thoughts and prayers easily and glibly. We do thoughts without thinking. We do prayers without praying. We commit that glib act because it is what we know how to do with an anemic God. Or because we are embarrassed to do more. Or because it is convenient and costs us nothing. Now, however, we are driven to our unthinkable thoughts about all that is ending, and all this we have lost, and all that leaves us with a sinking feeling. Now, however, we are driven, some of us, to unutterable prayers. We are driven to such prayer by awareness that our usual reliabilities are gone. We are driven to you, the abiding God, when other helpers fail and comforts flee. Thus, we are bold to pray. We are bold to ask because it will be given. So we pray for the end of the virus, the health of the neighborhood, for the recovery of the economy. We are bold to seek because you will be found we seek your mercy and your goodness and your generosity. So let yourself be found by us. We are bold to knock because it will be opened. We know many doors slammed shut. Doors of health and safety and comfort and fun. Open to us the door of life and love and peace and joy. Here we are in your presence. We ask for bread, the bread of life, the bread of abundance, the bread of neighbourly sharing. Do not give us a stone or a crumb. We ask for fish, the fish of a good diet, the fish of your abundant waters, the fish that signs the gospel. Do not give us a snake or the hiss of poison. We dare to pray, not because we are at our wit's end, but because you are the centre of our life. 
Our hope is in no other save in thee alone. So hear, heal, save, restore. Be the God you have promised to be. Amen. We say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And a prayer for the pandemic. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those who are vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who have to choose between preserving their health or paying their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools or classes close, remember those who have no options. May we who have had to cancel our trips, remember those who have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our cushion money in the tumult of the economic market, remember those who have no cushion at all. May we who settle in for a lockdown at home, remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us find ways to be the loving embrace to our neighbours. Amen. Our last hymn says, your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain from beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah. For our closing prayer and blessing, some words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. 
so that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.